So with that, I will uh, jump into some, some microeconomics content. We had just finished up kind of the first, the first module of the class, going over some themes in environmental and ecological economics. Uh, this section, we're going to just do some quick review of, of key microeconomics concepts. The reason we want to, to devise these, these theories and models in the first place is because they help us make predictions of human behavior. So anytime you want to, to change out some outcome in society, you want to implement some policy, put some restriction in place or, or increase taxes or, or pr provide some other incentive in some other way, you want to have some understanding about how people respond, how you can expect people to respond to those, those nudges or those incentives or those policies. And this, these economic models of supply and demand are, um, are tools for, for making those predictions. So that's, that's kind of why we, are, um, why, why we as environmental economists find, find those things useful. We, we care about the, the behavior of suppliers um, because they're the ones that are producing products. They're the ones that are maybe using natural resources and transforming them into goods and services um, that perhaps have some negative environmental effects. And so if we can describe their behavior with, with like a supply function, that can give us some hint as to maybe how to modify their behavior. If we want, if we wish that they would be acting a little bit differently, we can use that information about, or that we can use that theory or model about how they behave in order to perhaps nudge them in a different direction relative to what they're doing right now. Same thing with consumers. If, if consumers are, are behaving in a way that, that is kind of causing problems overall for society, either environmental problems or social, other social problems, we might want to, to provide some, some nudge for people to behave differently and knowing something about the demand and de demand functions um, will be key for, for giving us a hint as to what to do or, or how, to, how to predict what's gonna happen if we were to do this or that as we are evaluating different options. We, we kind of are, are after this, this, this idea of, a, of an efficient level of environmental quality. Um, and that's kind of the, ultimately that's the goal. It's a little bit of an abstract goal, um, but for each problem, in principle, what we're trying to do is achieve some efficient, um, efficient level. And, and we'll talk about that, what that means a little bit more in, in just a moment with a, with a concrete example. I wanna make a distinction between positive e economic analysis and normative economic analysis. These are somewhat different from one another in terms of what they strive to do. Positive economic analysis just wants to be description of what the world is. It wants to you know, collect information and find patterns and, and test hypotheses and come to conclusions um, where we can have measurable, a measurable evaluation of, of whether that hypothesis is true or false. It's a little bit more scientific in that way. Normative economic analysis instead is a little bit more value laden. It, it's a little bit more judgmental. It's a little bit more um, describing not what is, but what we think should happen. So it's um, once you've gone from description and pattern seeking to trying to make an evaluation and make a recommendation, you're in kind of a different world. You're, you've sort of taken a step, you've taken a step into something a little, a little bit outside of science, but it's still valuable because we have to have these debates and, and discussions about what to do. It's just that it's not, it's not the same thing as um, describing how the world is. It's describing something of how you want the world to be, how you wish the world would be. It's, it's more aspirational and more idealized than simply a, a raw description of what you see. So an example of positive economics would be just um, a case where you collect some data on prices and quantities, you observe consumers' behavior, and you make a prediction that says, if we increase the gasoline tax to $2 per gallon, gasoline purchases will fall uh, by between three or 4%. That's a positive statement. That's a statement about how we believe the world is. That's a descriptive statement about the world and about human behavior. A normative statement would be the gasoline tax should be increased to $2 per gallon for some reason, for some maybe reduction in pollution or reduction in dependence on foreign oil or um, 
you know, climate change uh, concerns. Those things are, when you make a recommendation about, about what you think ought to happen with the gasoline tax, um, that's intrinsically a, a normative statement. It's a, it's a judgment about what you think, the, how, how you think the world ought to be, or how you would like the world to be relative to the way it is. And that's just a little bit different than positive economic analysis. So let's get to some discussion here of, of economic efficiency. We've already hinted at this a little bit in the first day of class where I asked the question of what's the socially optimal level of pollution. And, you know, we got a, a variety of, of different um, responses and opinions about that. And it's, it's, not as if, um, it's not as if there is a right answer to that question of what the socially optimal pollution is because you're dealing with uh, many diverse individuals, all with different objectives and goals and tastes and desires. And to, to say that there's a single level of pollution that's, that's best when you want to try to aggregate all those, all those um, diverse preferences, it's really impossible to do um, objectively, but there is some kind of um, economic criteria that we can use, which is one, is one criteria that we can use to, to make that judgment about what the socially optimal level is. And then that's an analysis we can do, but then we can also bring in other kinds of judgments and other kinds of values as well if we wanted to. For example, you remember from the, the, the safe minimum standard discussion, we had this, this rectangle with um, you know, irreversibility on the, on the x-axis, severity on the y-axis, and we, we, we separated those, those different regions according to the kinds of things that we wanted to allow, trade-offs, the, the kinds of natural capital where we wanted to allow substitution and, and allow for cost-benefit analysis. That was this, um, this bottom portion where we were allowing trade-offs, you know, whereas we had this other region of this space with very severe and irreversible things where we decided we don't want to make any trade-offs. So right away, if, if, we're, if we're talking about economic efficiency, we're already, we're already deciding that we want to be in this bottom right-hand side of that, of that rectangle. Um, because, because if remember the, the upper left hand side of that rectangle, we've already decided we're not willing to make trade offs. We're not willing to consider benefits and costs because these outcomes are just undesirable in and of themselves and, and we're going to put them off limits from the start. Whereas to the, to, to the, to the right and below that line, um, we've decided that, that there's, there's substitution that's possible and we can make trade offs between different uses of the environment for those kinds of things. And so this, this kind of analysis we're about to do here is kind of already assuming that we are willing to make those trade offs. Okay, and then that's one, that's one, that's one part of the calculation. Once we make, once we do that benefit cost analysis that becomes part of the calculation. And then we want to consider perhaps other things as well to complement that analysis. But in general, what's happening with, with economic efficiency is we want to look for the thing that's going to achieve the highest net benefits, the highest benefits relative to the costs or benefits, benefits minus cost. And we're going to, I'm going to pr uh, present an example of sulfur dioxide pollution to kind of illustrate this trade-off between benefits and costs. So as you produce coal, you can, you, or as you produce electricity, you have to burn coal and and that's um, the burning of that coal allows you to produce electricity, which lets you um, have lights inside your house. It lets you uh, have TV and electronics and, and your refrigerator can, can run. And that's a benefit. That's a good thing. Uh, but there's also burning that coal produces some nasty side effects. And so that's, that's the cost in this case. And, and then we want to evaluate, you know, if we're, if we're thinking about what's the efficient level of SO2, we want to make some comparison between those benefits and costs. As we do this, I'm going to assume that there's some baseline level of, of sulfur dioxide that's being emitted naturally in the absence of any kind of intervention. There's some kind of amount of coal and sulfur dioxide production that, that these electricity producers are going to want to produce um, just in the natural course of their market operations. And then we're going to define reduction or abatement. Abatement is just a synonym for reduction. 
we're going to define abatement as any reduction in sulfur dioxide relative to that sort of status quo benchmark. So anytime I talk about tons of sulfur dioxide reduced, it's always in reference to this sort of status quo level of sulfur dioxide. So let's think about the costs first. The, the cost of reducing sulfur dioxide, if, we, if we're starting from the status quo and we wanna start reducing a few tons of sulfur dioxide, the first thing we can do is increase the efficiency of our plant. And this is gonna be relatively cheap to under, undertake because even though it might cost you a little bit to make those um, retrofits or to modify your, product, your, your process a little bit to make, that, um, to make it more efficient, you actually save some money in the process because the coal plant is able to get more electricity out of a given unit of coal by increasing the efficiency of their plant. And so they, they inherently save a little bit of money along the way of reducing their sulfur dioxide. So that's, that's a little bit of a, a inex, very inexpensive measure that you can do right away to reduce your sulfur dioxide emissions. If you want to uh, reduce more than that, like there, there's a, only a certain level at which you can improve effic efficiency and then it's, it's sort of impossible to make, make your machines any more efficient just because of the way the physics and the engineering and the chemistry works. But you, there's still other things you can do. So let's say that you're an electricity generator in Maine and you get your, your coal from, from uh, Pennsylvania, which has a high sulfur content. One, one substitution or modification you can make is you can decide you're gonna switch your production source to coal from Eastern Kentucky, which has a lower sulfur content. That's gonna allow you to, to produce your electricity and, and produce less sulfur byproducts, less sulfur dioxide as you burn that, that coal but it's gonna cost you a little bit more because it has to be shipped from a little bit further away. So that's gonna be a, a little bit more of a costly measure than just the, um, the efficiency improvements because you have to pay the extra transportation costs and you don't get the, 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 the cost savings from the, the efficiency improvements that you make in your plant. So that's gonna be a little costlier than the previous step. Now, let's say you've, um, You've, you've gotten some of your coal from Eastern Kentucky, but you still, you still need to produce um, electricity with, with even lower sulfur dioxide. Let's say you wanted to reduce even more than that. In that case, you might have to ac actually switch your source again to something that's even further away. Um, Wyoming has, has reserves of coal that have even lower sulfur content than Eastern Kentucky. And so you could switch your, your production source to Wyoming. That's a much further distance. It would have to be shipped by rail um, from even a, a, a longer distance. And so your costs of acquiring that coal are gonna be even higher. Um, but again, it's gonna allow you to make further reductions beyond what you could do with the, um, the switching of your source to Eastern Kentucky coal. Let's say that you've, you've, you've completely switched your source all the, all the way over to Wyoming coal. That's, um, there's a limit to that. Like once you've switched your, all your coal to Wyoming coal, you can't continue um, switching more uh, to anything that's less, has less sulfur content if you wanna reduce more. So then at that point you have to maybe install some kind of technology on the end of your smokestack. Something that's gonna catch the gas before it leaves the smokestack and combine it with some other chemicals to extract out the sulfur from the, um, from the gas, turn it into a solid, and then maybe take that, take that solid sludge and, and put it somewhere else um, so that it doesn't go into the air. That, that kind of equipment or that kind of technological process um, will allow you to reduce sulfur dioxide by, by quite a bit more than before, uh, but it's gonna be significantly more expensive to install that, that um, fancy equipment relative to what you were doing before, which was just switching your source to a, a, a source of coal to a different, um, a, a, a source that was further away that had higher transportation costs. So those are some measures that you can undertake. And if we kind of think about the cumulative costs associated with those, with those measures, you know, your first measures of, of improving efficiency are gonna be very, very cheap. In fact, they might, you know, they're gonna save you a little bit of money along the way. So those are gonna be reducing from 
or go, you know, going from zero tons of abatement to, to that level of abatement is going to be very cheap. Then you have to switch your source um, if you want to abate more pollution. So if you want to go from this first blue tick mark to the second, you have to, you have to create those efficiency improvements and switch your source of coal, and that's going to be a little costlier. Um, if you want to reduce even more than that, you have to switch your source again to a source that's even further away. Re remember that was in Wyoming, which is, um, you know, more than more than twice the distance between Maine and Kentucky, and so that's going to entail much higher acquisition costs for that input. And then the um, the the last measure was to in install that that uh, costly end of pipe technology, which uh, filtered the, the sulfur dioxide out of the smokestack, that's going to have um, an even higher cost. And so your, your cost of abatement is going to start at zero and just increase as you start to try to reduce your, your, um, your sulfur dioxide by more and more. So you get this pattern where um, in fact, it's increasing, but it's also kind of increasing at an increasing rate. The slope, the slope of this curve is sort of tending to go up as you increase your, your, um, your reduction. And so that's going to be represented by this marginal cost curve. This was kind of a total cost curve or cumulative cost curve. What the marginal cost curve would look like, would it, be, it would be low at low tons and it's going to increase at high tons. That's the, remember, this is the dollars, this is dollars per ton. Because we're dealing with marginal effects, this is dollars per ton. And so that represents kind of the slope of that cumulative cost curve at different levels of abatement. So that's costs. Now, making these reductions in sulfur dioxide pollution um, comes, up, comes along with some benefits too. Quite a, quite a quite substantial benefits in a lot of cases. So the first units of sulfur dioxide abatement are going to end up having very positive effects on health. So when when the when when no abatement was happening, the air was very polluted. There was a lot of sulfur dioxide that people were breathing in, and that was causing a lot of respiratory illness. And so when you when you make those first reductions in sulfur dioxide, you're you're really improving the the, the health condition of some people that are at very high risk. And so those benefits are very high for those first units of, of abatement. Once you've done that, you've sort of helped save people's lives in, in some cases or put them at, at lower risk of death and, and, and severe illness. The next uh, units of abatement, when you, when you reduce beyond that level, will start to reduce people's eye and throat irritation that they get from, from that pollution, which is a very positive thing. It's gonna make people people's lives a lot more comfortable living in those urban areas, but it's, it's a little bit less valuable than, than the, um, you know, saving someone from, from that severe respiratory illness or, or preventing their, 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 um, their death. So still very valuable, but, but a little bit less so. And then the units after that, once you've, once you've reduced to a point where you've kind of eliminated that eye and throat irritation, um, the, the, you, you start to then reduce acid rain, and that's going to improve the health of forests and lake ecosystems. And so that has, again, that has a lot of environmental value. It's going to improve the, the condition of, of the water, the quality of the water and the soil, which, which has value, but it's a little bit less of a direct effect on people's immediate well-being. And so you might, you might consider that to be a little bit less of an incremental benefit relative to those previous health benefits. And then finally, once, you know, if you continue reducing that pollution, really what you're doing is you're reducing the, the corrosion on the exterior of buildings and, and monuments. So those stone, stone buildings and monuments that would otherwise be getting hit by acid rain don't have to be refurbished as, as frequently. They don't, they don't corrode as much with, with that cleaner air and, and that reduction in acid rain. And so that's, that's kind of the last thing that you're that you're um, improving as you reduce pollution more and more and more. Those, those, that, that, that corrosion doesn't get reduced with these first units when you just are improving direct health outcomes. 
but you have to reduce more and more to start stopping the, the corrosion processes from happening from the acid rain. So that's kind of the last, the last frontier of, of improvement. So if we go back to the, um, the, uh, the diagram where we were talking about costs, we can, we can add we can add benefits to this. And re remember we said the first units of, of abatement were extremely valuable because they, they um, prevent severe illness and death. The next units are still valuable, but less, less of an increase, less of a jump, um, because it's just stopping some of that eye and throat irritation. After that, you start improving um, acid rain outcomes, which improves water and soil quality health, which is valuable, but it's, it's less of a direct impact on health. And then the final, you know, reduction in, in corrosion, again, produces some benefit, but it's a little bit um, less of an incremental benefit. It's still, it's still valuable. So you, you add a little bit less to your, to your total cumulative benefits as you make that, as you make that change. So really what you want to do when you're, when you're evaluating this problem is find the point at which the difference between these benefits and costs is the, the largest. You want to find the place, the, the, the point of abatement where the, the gap between total benefits and total costs is the largest. And so that's, I, I don't know if this is exactly the gap, but theoretically where you want, what you want to find is you want to find the place at which the slope, the slope of this total cost curve equals the slope of this total benefit curve, or, or you want the marginal benefits equal to the marginal costs. And so if we, if we translate, just like we translated that total cost curve to a marginal cost curve, we can, we can translate the total benefit curve to a marginal benefit curve, which remember that's gonna start, that's gonna start with very high marginal benefits. Remember the first, the first tons of abatement are extremely valuable. And then the, the extra incremental benefits start to decline as you improve, um, and solve problems that are less and less severe. And so eventually you sort of get this, this diminishing marginal benefit pattern, which suggests that there's, there's a point at which you'd be better, you'd be um, sort of maximizing the total, the total trade-offs. You'd sort of be balancing those trade-offs perfectly at the point where the marginal, the marginal costs are equal to the marginal benefits. And we can think about why that's, why that's the desirable place to be, we can think about it in terms of what happens if you're somehow off, off of that curve some way. So if we think about a different quantity of abatement, let's say Q1, rather, rather than Q star, let's think about Q1. This would be a case where we are reducing pollution at a cost per ton that's actually higher than the benefit per ton that we get from that reduction. So it's like, you know, we're, we're installing these expensive scrubbing technology on these on these smokestacks and the only benefit we're getting is that we we have we don't have to refurbish the exterior of buildings as frequent as frequently as we did before we're only preventing the um the exterior of those buildings from corroding and and, and slowing that process down a little bit um, so we're spending a lot of extra money on this abatement but we're not getting that much for it that's a case like q1 where the marginal costs are higher than the marginal benefits and the losses associated with that, graphically and analytically, the losses associated with that overproduction of, of abatement, those losses are represented by this, um, the area between the marginal cost curve and the marginal benefit curve between Q1 and Q star. Alternatively, we could think about a case where we're not, we're not reducing enough. We're actually, we're actually kind of under providing abatement so that would be a case where maybe Q2, where it's not that costly to reduce um, that sulfur dioxide a little bit more. We only maybe have to, to go get our coal from Kentucky rather than Pennsylvania. And the health benefits in terms of reduced eye and throat irritation are still pretty large. Those marginal benefits are higher than the marginal costs. That's a worthwhile thing to do. So we would prefer if we could move our quantity of, of abatement from Q2 up to a little bit higher level. And we're gonna be moving up to a little higher level as long as the marginal benefits of doing so are higher than the marginal costs. 
So it would make sense to move to the right if we're here. We'd move to the right a little bit. If we're right here, marginal benefits still exceed marginal costs. We could do a little bit better, so we'll move to the right a little bit more. And we get to a point eventually where, where we stop because there's no more gains to be had. There's no more marginal, marginal benefits, net of marginal costs that we can, we can accrue. And so again, the area between these two curves is going to represent the total benefits to, to moving from Q2 to Q star, to moving from a case where we're under providing abatement to a point where we're, we're providing it at a level that makes, that makes sense, where we're trading off the costs and benefits optimally. So we've talked about the efficiency and pollution reduction. Again, that's one framework. Um, that's kind of the economic framework as applied to pollution control. Um, there could, again, there could be other reasons we want to reduce pollution and, and we might just decide that um, this kind of pollution is completely unacceptable and, and there's no trade-offs that we're going to allow. But if we are in the world of, of allowing trade-offs and substitutions, this is kind of how we would proceed with that analysis. Okay, so we talked about uh, the, use, the, the usefulness of being able to predict consumer behavior with, um, with kind of some theory of demand or some, some demand function. Um, one of the ways that we can, we can utilize this as an environmental economist is the demand ultimately has to do with how people will change their consumption behavior in response to some kind of price change. And so if we wanted to produce a different outcome in consumption, if we wanted consumers to act differently, we can take advantage of the fact that they respond to prices and we can maybe implement some kind of incentive or price mechanism that would automatically induce people to do less of what we don't want them to do or do more of something that we do want them to do. Ultimately, what, what demand is about is willingness to pay. Um, it's, it's, it's about what somebody would be willing to pay. And if we observe them paying a certain price in a market for a particular quantity of, of a good, we know that they're willing to pay at least, um, at least that, that amount. And, and so the, the, the law of demand says that as things get more expensive, as the price goes up, people will, will want less of, of those things. When the price goes down, people will want a little bit more of those things on the margin. This is actually from the, the textbook, chapter three appendix. This is a demand curve for, for gasoline. Uh, this is the demand schedule, and this is the, the demand curve. The demand curve traces out different prices and quantity, different pairs of prices and quantities that people want, different quantities that people want to buy at different prices. And as, as I mentioned before, as the price goes up, people want less. As the price goes down, people want a little bit more. And let me just explain a little bit why, why, that, why demand has that downward slope. Um, so demand has that downward slope because of substitutions that, that consumers can make. So if the price goes up, for example, people can choose to consume less gasoline in a, in a number of ways. They can decide to combine two trips together. Maybe they were, they were gonna take two trips on two separate days. They might try to, to take both of those trips on the same day because the, those two locations are sort of in the same area. They can save um, driving, total driving time. They might decide to carpool and kind of split the cost of, of commuting perhaps. They might, to, they might decide to, to take public transit instead of um, buying their own uh, gasoline and car. They might, in the long run, they might decide to relocate um, closer to work and just have less, less of a commuting distance. Or they might, they might decide to buy a, a smaller car and have less, um, less spending uh, per, per unit of, of mile driven by, by driving a car that has a better gas mileage. So these are all substitutions that people can make if the price goes up. They can make these substitutions and allocate their, their gasoline a little bit differently, but reducing their consumption. Conversely, if the price goes down, these things are kind of annoying, like the, you know, combining trips, carpooling, public transit. It's, it's a little bit of a, an extra thing you have to think about. Um, so if, if the price of gas goes down, you might decide it's not worth it to you to combine those trips or to carpool. And so then, then your gasoline consumption will go up. 
So that's kind of why why we get this downward slope and this this sort of negative relationship between price and quantity. There's also things that will shift will shift demand. So the, what I just described was was a, a movement along a demand curve where price changes and you re, you change your quantity consumed in response to that price. There's also things that can shift demand where price doesn't change but you still demand more or less of that good at that same price. And so shifters of demand are anything that's not the price, which can affect how much of the good that you want or how much of the good that, this, that society as a whole wants to consume. So things that can shift demand include income. As you get wealthier, um, you naturally want to buy more of a lot of things. And, and if, as your income goes up, you'll be less concerned about the, uh, the effect that, the, that, that those gas expenditures are having on your disposable income. And so you'll be willing to, to, to pay, pay more for gas and to, to, to consume more gas. The prices of substitutes matter a lot. So how, how expensive it is, both in terms of time and money to take public transportation, that's gonna be something that changes um, how much gasoline you want. Just basic perceptions and tastes of how desirable it is to drive a car or how, how in fashion it is to drive a car or to have a particular size of car. That's gonna be something that changes your quantity demanded. And then just, um, just demographic factors in terms of the number of buyers of gasoline will affect on, on uh, for the economy as a whole, it will affect how much, how much gasoline is, is demanded at a particular price. So that's demand. Um, supply is just the 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 production side of that. How much, how how high does the price have to be for a firm to want to supply a certain amount? Ultimately, this has to do with with production costs. So a firm is going to be willing to supply a good into the market as long as the price is 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 enough to compensate them for what it costs them to produce that good. Um, so it's it's intrinsically related to production costs, and as as price goes up suppliers are going to be more and more willing to put more units out there. They're going to be more and more willing to sell more units into the economy. As the price goes down, they're going to, they're going to be less and less willing to supply those units. So similar to the way that we had um, demand for gasoline and a downward, downward relationship for gasoline, we have this upward relationship between price and the quantity supplied. And I just wanted to highlight where, where this upward, upward, um, slope of the supply curve comes from. This upward pattern of, of a supply curve is kind of assuming that your, your capacity, sort of your capital is fixed at a, at a point in time. And so in order to produce more, you have to sort of draw resources away from other valuable things. And producing more gasoline in this case has opportunity costs because gasoline comes from petroleum, which can be used for all kinds of other products um, and so any, any gasoline or any petroleum you're using to make gasoline has to take away, has to necessarily take away some petroleum that can be used for some of these other purposes. So if you're a given supplier, you have, you know, if you, if you're a supplier of gasoline and you want to make more gasoline, you have to take away petroleum away from, um, you know, uses for, of jet fuel or other plastics or other asphalt. Um, or lubricants like motor oil, you have to draw resources away from those other uses, which as you wanna increase um, the supply of gas, um, you're gonna first start drawing away resources from those uh, other products that are less valuable first, but then as you wanna increase production more and more, you have to draw resources away from things that have a higher and higher opportunity cost. And so that's why you get this, this increasing supply curve is because the more units you want to produce, the, the, the higher the opportunity cost, the more and more things that you have, the more and more other products that you have to forego, the more and more other valuable products that you have to forego in order to produce more gasoline. So that's, that's kind of some intuition of, of where, the, where the upward slope of the um, supply curve comes from. It's similar to the way that just in the same way that, that producing more sulfur dioxide abatement got costlier and costlier because your, the measures that you had to use got more and more extreme. It's the same case for any good, that the, the more you want to supply of something, 
you have to use more and more extreme measures to produce it. And so your, your marginal costs are gonna go up as you try to, to increase the production of that good. So that's some intuition for, for the upward slope of the supply curve. 